Jonathan Taplin. Good morning. Um, I'm going to make some people a little bit uncomfortable this morning, and I don't really want to do that, but as Walt reminded us last night, um, we still have some work to do to make the internet what it could be. So this is my new book that just came out. And what I want to talk about is two things. One of what the large internet monopolies have done to the creative class, specifically musicians, journalists, and secondly, what they've done to our democracy. So I come at this with both humility and optimism. Optimism because I was lucky enough to work with Bob Dylan and the band in the 60s when culture was changing things. Um, and optimism because I started the first streaming video on demand company in 1996. But of course, that also led to humility because I started the first streaming video on demand company in 1996, Entertainer, which was, by the way, funded by a lot of people in this room, Microsoft, Intel, NBC, Comcast. Um, and if you want to hear the story of that, you can read my book. So the, the guy who was in that picture you saw of me and the band, Levon Helm, was the drummer in the band and lived a very good life even though the band stopped recording in 78. Uh, his recordings, the recordings continue to sell and even through the late 80s, the CD came on so everybody renewed the record collection and in 2000, he got throat cancer. And in 2000, Napster arrived. And the royalties that he relied on just stopped. And he didn't have enough money to pay for his health care. And that seemed deeply unfair to me. So I tried to unpack what had happened. And so I went back to 68 when really uh, the internet was first being involved. Uh, and the whole idea was to, as Nick Negroponte said, decentralize control and harmonize people. And hippies like Stuart Brand with the whole Earth Electronic Network really were involved in this thing. It was kind of a countercultural project. But by 1987, when Peter Thiel came out of Stanford, a, a different philosophy came to being, which was a libertarian philosophy schooled on the work of Ayn Rand, who believed that really, as you know from her books, like Atlas Shrugged, is you've got this brave entrepreneur who is always impeded by the mob, by democracy. And so Thiel said, I no longer believe that capitalism and democracy are incompatible. And if we could create a business sector that had no regulation, no taxes, no copyright, no impedances to monopoly, we could really do something wonderful. And he believed that would happen and that the technology sector would become the largest engine of the economy. And it turned out he was right. So 10 years ago, Exxon, Citibank, General Electric were the largest corporations in the world and today they're all tech companies. And these tech companies have extraordinary market power. Google has 88% market share in search advertising. Facebook has, with all its services, about 72% of mobile social. Amazon has 75% of the books business and runs what Paul Krugman calls a monopsony, which means that it can force publishers' prices lower and lower and lower, and therefore, pushing people out of business. And because, of course, we had no taxes on the internet, Amazon was able to put 3,000 bookstores out of business because they had to pay sales taxes, and Amazon didn't. And as Mary Meeker pointed out yesterday, 85 cents of every new dollar of advertising spent online went to either a Google company or a Facebook company. That is as close to a monopoly as we can get. So the question is, what happened to the creative class while this incredible rise of these three 
big companies. Well, this is the music business, and it's really a tale of digital destruction. And this is the newspaper business. Both of these businesses had their revenues fall by 75% in the last 10 years. It's disastrous. So there are 50% fewer people working in journalism today than there were 10 years ago. And as Peter Thiel says, competition is for losers. If you want to create and capture lasting value, you need to build a monopoly. So what is the real effect for artists on monopoly? So this is just one aspect of this. So YouTube has about 54% market share of the streaming audio business. That is, files that have simply a picture of a record cover and an audio file, not video at all. And yet YouTube pays less than 11% of the revenue into the streaming audio business. If I had a song that was popular enough to get a 1 million downloads on iTunes, I could make $900,000. If I got 1 million streams on YouTube, I could make $900. That's not enough to pay the rent for my son who works in the indie music business in Oakland. So the second aspect I want to talk about is one of democracy. And, and Hillary Clinton, I thought, was quite eloquent on this, but I don't think she went far enough. As the Washington Post pointed out last week, both Facebook and Google could tell us a lot more about what happened in the election. They know who created the 50,000 fake accounts on Facebook. They know where the YouTube videos came from that were posted to YouTube. They know all of this stuff, but they don't want to. And as if you've read this new article, in Wired on the kids in Macedonia who are making 10,000 a month manufacturing fake news, you will understand, as Tim Berners-Lee said, that all they needed was a Facebook page and a Google AdSense account on their fake news places. And as Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web said, the Google ad system trained them just like you train a dog. So they learned that untruth was more clickable than truth. And you could see from this chart what happened the day that Mark Zuckerberg agreed to take the humans out of the trending topics thing. Cambridge Analytica, Steve Bannon, and all their people were able to play the algorithms on Facebook, bomb it with bots, and drive the fake news stories to the top of the trending topics, and of course, the real news declined. And none of this has been solved. Now, Mr. Zuckerberg says, well, you, the user, should be responsible for doing that. That's the same thing that YouTube says to musical artists. You're responsible for getting your content off of YouTube. So I file a takedown request for YouTube to get one of the band tunes off the thing, and it goes down, and then two days later, it goes right back up again. It's like a game of whack-a-mole. So this willful blindness goes farther. When I first started this book, there were 44,000 ISIS videos on YouTube. Now, YouTube knew where all of those videos were uploaded from, and they probably knew where maybe some of the advertising that was on the front of those videos was getting funneled to, literally the bank accounts. And of course, it wasn't until Procter & Gamble got a little irritated that its ads were on the front of beheading videos that this got some attention. So what are these businesses? Well, they're basically in the surveillance capitalism business. And as Walt pointed out in his final article, we need much stronger standards for security and privacy than now exists. It's time to stop dancing around the privacy and security issues and pass real binding laws. Because as these tentacles push deeper into the home with the Echo and the Google Home, as the district attorney in Mississippi found out, 
you know, when he subpoenaed the records from Amazon when the domestic violence incident, these things are always on and they're always listening. So this has some real problems in the future because I've been on a book tour. I've had people come up to me and two weeks ago a neurobiologist came up to me and said, I'm gonna send you this paper that we've just published about using a smartphone as a detector of Parkinson's disease. It's as easy as detecting how many steps you climbed in you know, your building yesterday. And it's recorded in the, it could be recorded in the same place. He says, my worry is someone will take the fact that the Parkinson's tremor is very distinct and sell that to health insurance companies, sell that to your employer, sell it to other people, because none of this is protected by HIPAA or any other things. The Consumer Reports people who are here have talked to me about how your auto insurance rates are set. You think they're set by your driving record. You're totally wrong. They're not set by your driving record. They're set by where you drive. So if there are two women live side by side in a nice suburban neighborhood in Brentwood, and one of them taught at a poor school downtown in Watts, her auto insurance rates might be as much as 20% higher than the woman who didn't leave Brentwood. Now, how did they get that information? You all know it's sitting on your smartphone. So I just want to end with a quote from Elizabeth Warren, who says, concentrated money and concentrated power, they in influence nearly every decision made in this town, but capture is not yet complete. Backstage, Wall and I were talking about this privacy issue, and he said, look, I raised this with Brian of Intel, and Yes, there's, he admits that there needs to be some real privacy regulation, but guess what? Intel, Facebook, and Google will determine what that regulation is. The same way that we need to have a take down, stay down law for creators to be able to get their content off of platforms they don't want it on, to be able to control their intellectual property. That is what we have to worry about because regulatory capture, as I talked about in the book, is a real deal. So I hope um, at least we can begin a conversation. I know that Tristan has had some attempts to do that, and I hope in the future we can talk about it some more. Thank you very much.